Get on one. It's so exciting. We're live. Ah. We'll see who comes and joins us. So I'll start off with a bit of an introduction and then we'll do the round and then Alexia, would you be okay to like kind of ask the first questions? Cool. How do I know who's joined? When does it tell me? Sorry, you, you asked me a question? Oh no, I was, I was just asking generally, how will we know when people are watching? <laughs> I have no idea, I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> Like we, uh, I think we are live because on the top right corner you've got the live. Uh, oh yes, yellow sign. Ah yeah. So, well, hello, well spotted. Everyone, I guess. Just have to. I'll have to guess in a couple of minutes if people are here or not. Then. <laughs> you know, like, people are going to see it afterwards on YouTube. So all they're going to see is like us chatting for the first few minutes of video of video. <laughs> Okay, so I think it's coming live at the moment. We are live. Uh, we'll be getting started in a bit. Sebastian has just joined us. Uh, and we will be wanting your questions for this evening's webinar on the most exciting topic of any webinar that FYG has ever done, which of course is reforming the European Parliament, which I know we're all very excited to talk about, but more importantly also how we can engage young people in politics. So we're going to be getting started in a bit. If you've got any questions, do leave them in the Facebook group. Do tweet them uh, at us. That would be fantastic. Perfect. And Sebastian, if you could just mute your microphone for now, that would be fab. Perfect. Right. OK, I think we'll probably get started. Uh, so good evening and welcome to FYEG's webinar on the best topic of all, reforming a parliament for young people. So we're going to be looking at two main themes this evening. Uh, we're going to be asking what kind of reform do we think generally needs to happen in the European Parliament? And we've heard all kinds of different ideas developing over the past couple of years uh, or even longer. And with certain changes in Europe happening, for example, Brexit, we need to know what's going to be happening with all those MEPs. There's going to be 73 spaces uh, in the chamber. What's going to happen with those? Is this an opportunity for us to have uh, lists of MEPs across Europe? Might Brexit even happen is another question we might ask. But also we need to be looking at uh, and the second part of our webinar will be looking at how do we actually engage young people in this process? And I think this is a question that has been asked for years and years. How do we engage young people in politics? And I think we are getting closer to the answer, but I don't think we've got there yet. But we want to talk about some of the ideas that have already been raised about this. So, for example, if we give votes to young people from the age of 16, would this have an effect? Would this engage more young people, especially if they were already at school uh, when they were learning about the voting process and could have educational support? Uh, and also, what can we do to support young people to be candidates uh, to the European Parliament? And m many people might not realise that across Europe, there's different ages you have to be to become an MEP. Uh, the lowest is 18, but I believe in some countries it goes as high as uh, 24 uh, in terms of age, 24, 25. So could there be a call to have a common age of candidacy across the whole of Europe? Would that make things fairer? So we're going to split uh, our webinar into kind of two sections. The first section for this first kind of 25 minutes or so uh, is going to be talking about the structures of the European Parliament and how they might change. And then the second part is going to be talking about how uh, we can look at specific measures to engage young people. But I think that a theme throughout is going to be around 
how these changes will impact the future of Europe. Uh, and we're now going to introduce uh, the panel of wonderful speakers we have to, but I thought I might as well introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Sam Murray. I am a co-coordinator of the FYEG, that's the Federation of Young European Greens, Future of Europe Working Group. Uh, and I will be moderating this evening alongside uh, the absolutely wonderful Alexia, who is a member of the working group and who will introduce herself in a bit. Uh, and we have been for the past year talking about all of these kind of issues uh, and with a Europe that's going through some quite challenging political times we've been trying to really get to the answer and this webinar is an example uh, of these topics and debates that we've been having. So I'm going to pass to my colleague Alexia to introduce herself. So I'm Alexia Delfos, I'm French, and I'm also a member of the Future of Europe Working Group. And, um, well, I've been interested in the topic of um, reforming the parliament since uh, last year, because I, I've studied uh, a lot uh, uh, European politics and uh, European law. And so I, I feel very involved um, in European politics in general, and uh, my involvement with FYG is also part of uh, of uh, this topic. So, well, I I just joined the the webinar for those reasons. Exciting, and you're going to be helping us ask some of the questions in the webinar today. But if you have any questions, do put them on the Facebook page, uh, or I believe you can probably tweet them at FYG as well. Uh, so do get involved. Uh, I'm going to ask Elisa to introduce yourself next, please. Thank you. I'm Elisa Gambardella. I'm 26 years old and a member of the Presidium of the Young European Socialists. Uh, I previously was a um, feminist network coordinator in YES, that is the acronym for Young European Socialists, uh, for those who are not very familiar with it. Um, what I do now is chairing the network for the future of Europe. So um, how YES works is that we have a presidium that is basically the executive committee. Then we have uh, networks that are uh, about our main pillar, what we consider uh, pillars as policies and structural issues that we ha have in society. For instance, we have the feminist network uh, and others. And then we have the bureau that is basically the assembly of yes. So um, just to mention that the network for the future of Europe is not in the bureau, is not at the network, other networks level, but in the presidium. And it's so because we understand this discussion to be the paramount one to really bring back to to the citizens and grassroots level, uh, the debate about the European Union in general, and we understand it to be the paramount discussion to be to make the European Union more inclusive and just for all. To to say it in one sentence, uh, do do you want me to introduce now what we do with our networking? Yes, or maybe later. Sure, go for it. Okay, thank you. So um, the network was established last year, and how it works. Uh, it's with a bottom-up approach. Um, we are an umbrella organization as YES, so we gather 50-ish member organizations all over Europe and beyond. And being an umbrella organization, there's uh, quite often, unfortunately, the tendency to, to have a more of a top-down than a bottom-up approach when elaborating our policies and positions. Uh, we believe also for the future of Europe, it is absolutely important instead to reverse this flow uh, for as hard as it can be, but definitely necessary. So what we do is instead of having uh, proposals that are coming from the Bureau or the Presidium to the member organizations, we are engaging our activists in a direct way through seminars, uh, workshops, and uh, a Facebook group where we are drafting our proposal. The process was kick-started by a discussion paper that was the outcome of a workshop we had at our summer camp last year. And uh, the proposal, the first set of proposals that we have, but it's a discussion paper that we call an alive document, meaning that it's going to be developed from now until the European elections at least. And for which I'm very much looking forward to the opportunity to cooperate with FYEG. 
this first set of proposals um, taking into account that we are a federalist organization, meaning that we also want the European Union to become uh, federal, are to increase the transparency of the decision-making process uh, in the EU. So, for instance, we, th we think the Commission must be permanently accountable to the European Parliament, including its directorate levels. Uh, we think that the decisions at the Council must contribute to improve the functioning of the EU, the life of its people, and serve the best interests of the Union. So the Member States must reinforce the use of mechanisms for cooperation that the Lisbon Treaty already foresee, including, for instance, the enhanced cooperation mechanism. We have a number of proposals that are about the policies and how to make the European Union um, just for all, but these are an that concern also political economy, but I don't think that these are the proposals we really centered on the topic we're dealing with tonight. So we'll skip them and invite you to read them on our website. Other proposals that are more centered on, on the topic we're discussing are to make the Erasmus Plus programs accessible for all. And I know it's not really about the institutional mechanism, but when talking about how to make the EU closer to its citizens, it's definitely something we believe it's important to stress. Uh, then, Sustainable development, again, it's not at the core of the discussion tonight, but we believe that it's part of making the EU more democratic for the reasons you know much better than me. And in terms of a real institutional mechanism, we totally agree with uh, your proposal also to, to allow 16 years old people uh, to vote for the, for the European Parliament. I come from a country where you have to be 25 years old to be candidate, so I totally feel the, the need for uh, lowering the age limit. We are totally in favor of transnational transnationals list and we deeply regretted the decision of the uh, EPP to basically uh, vote down the possibility to redistribute the UK, the seats that were, uh, that are <laughs> for the UK representatives and probably won't be anymore um, to be elected through a transnational list mechanism. We are also in favor of the Spitzen candidate, and we believe that it should be chosen by primaries. Um, and we also believe that since the political youth, uh, the youth participation to politics is very low, but we also know and data tell us that uh, our generation is the less Eurosceptical, or uh, to say the least, or to say the best, uh, the most in favor of EU integration. Uh, but we also see that our generation doesn't uh, show up uh, very much when it comes to elections, unfortunately. We believe that uh, there should be an easier access to the EU funds for the youth organizations as to uh, further enhance the possibility for our generation to, first of all, understand the debate about the European Union, second of all, participate to it. In terms of uh, spits and candidate and uh, being in a historical moment when uh, not only the EU is kind of or about to shrink or <laughs> uh, it's been discussed at its very fundamental values and at the same time the left wing is kind of shrinking unfortunately. Um, we believe that it is absolutely important that our generation uh, play a crucial role in not only renewing the left but also the European Union and all this long premise that I apologize for is to say that uh, I think it would be very important if for the next European elections, not only we campaign together for a Spitzen candidate elected through primaries, but we also campaign and advocate with our parties to have a common Spitzen candidate uh, for the progressive caucus as whole. Of course, respecting uh, each other differences, respecting the fact we belong to different parties, but trying to show a real interest in changing the EU, the left wing, and uh, therefore make the EU uh, also more youth friendly. Hope I stayed in the five minutes. I guess I didn't, but I'll shut <laughs> up immediately. Don't worry, I didn't put a clock on. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's some, some really interesting ideas uh, raised there in, in your introduction, Elisa, particularly uh, spits and candidates, and I think we can go into a bit more detail uh, in discussion as well. I think we can add that to our list of discussions. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'm now going to go to the next person along in the queue, uh, which is uh, Yusa. 
just turn my microphone on. Okay, thank you. Um, so, hi, I'm Jose Arvignani. Uh, I'm the president of Young European Movement UK, uh, which is the British section of the Young European Federalists. And at the European level, I'm the co-chair of the Working Group on European Elections. So what we are doing is we are preparing a European election campaign together uh, at the European level. So maybe I'll start from the UK level, what we are doing. Well, keeping the UK in the EU, basically, uh, that's what was mentioned uh, initially. Um, just try, try, trying to keep those 73 MEPs uh, where, where they are. But, uh, but at the European level, of course, we are in favour of a transnational list. Um, you might ask how, how those things fit together, but you can always redistribute seats, of course. So um, when, it when it comes to a European level, uh, we are in favour of votes at 16 uh, for the European Parliament, uh, where it is possible according to national con national constitutions. And um, of course, Spitzen Kandidaten, transnational lists in general, are very strong focuses for us in our campaigning. Um, we also were deeply disappointed uh, when the European Parliament voted against transnational lists in February. But Spitzen Kandidaten is something that we keep campaigning for. Now, um, this, comes, this goes to personal views, uh, but personally, I believe that individual commissioners as well ought to have a democratic mandate. Um, you've, got, you've got, say, the Dutch commissioner, the Finnish commissioner, whatever. Um, those people could be elected. Um, the, Bul the Bulgarian commissioner at the moment uh, is, is, is in the commission and entered, that, entered the commission from the European Parliament after the resignation of uh, Kristina Georgieva uh, earlier. So that is entirely possible. And of course, where all of this is going is towards a genuine European level party system. We, of course, have your, your parties together in the European Parliament already. Um, there is group discipline in the European Parliament. Well, you can you can go look at vote, voting cohesion uh, and vote watch EU. Uh, you can see a high degrees of cohesion there. But citizens don't see that. And pers personally, I think who's, uh, who's at fault there is national level political parties because um, w when you're campaigning on European elections, um, it is the national level parties that the citizens see uh, is the Finnish Social Democrats, fin uh, Finnish Centre Party, Finnish Centre Right Party, which are campaigning on the streets. And they are the gatekeepers who decide whether the Euro Party's logos are on there. Now, transnational lists would be a very good device to ensure that the those Euro Parties are visible because it, uh, if if candidates from your sister parties from other countries are not promoted, then those people are not going to get elected. So that way you automatically promote the European level party. You, in, you introduce European level themes into a debate um, so that you're not talking about national, <laughs> national foreign policy, but you're actually talking about what's going to be discussed in the European Parliament. So the Young European Federalists remains in favour of transnational lists. Um, we hope that this was not the last chance to, to introduce them. Well, what else shall I say? Um, we are we're generally in favour of a federal Europe, and a very important element of that is a democratic Europe um, that comprises a European level party system. That's what I have to say. I'm happy to answer any questions, of course. Thank you very much. And again, some really interesting ideas we can definitely add to the list to talk about. For example, should commissioners be elected uh, and what would be the impact uh, of that? And also, do national parties bear a responsibility to, to talk about European politics more widely and engage more people with that? So thank you very much for your, for your thoughts there. Uh, and as uh, you are representing uh, Young European Movement. It makes, I think, natural sense for us to go to European Movement International uh, and Vanessa. Hi, uh, let me know if you can't hear me or if my microphone is on uh, too soft, if everything is fine. Can you hear me? Yes, all good. Okay, perfect, cool. Uh, yes, my name is Vanessa, I'm 26 and um, I work for the European Movement International um, as policy coordinator. I know Sam actually from, uh, well, only recently we met at uh, our 48 Hours for Democracy, which is a very funny name uh, for a two day event that we had, um, especially what it's called, uh, 48 Hours for Democracy, with a uh, hundred people in the room uh, figuring out um, how to improve the European um, democratic system, which is, I guess, what we're also talking about now. Um, so yeah, I, I've been with the European movement uh, for over a year now. 
and um well, maybe from a, a personal point of view, why why this topic, electoral reform and, and um, European democracy is, is in my interest. Uh, I grew up in, in Germany, but uh, I, I feel more European than German, to be honest. And also my parents have a different background. So um, I, I often find that there's um, way too much um, national focus in all these debates. Um, no matter in which country you are, and it would be great in the future to see more European campaigning, uh, European focuses, and more connection between campaigns. And I think, um, or at least also in the eyes of the European movement, we think that this would be a great opportunity, the next elections, to change something. Um, we, of course, also see that there are a few sensitive issues, um, we support transnational lists and it's also disappointing to see um, the recent developments, but I don't think um, that this is going to stop them altogether. And I think also there's a lot of debate at the moment, which is great, and a lot of ideas, which we saw not only at this 48 Hours for Democracy, there were so many good ideas out there, how we could change um, electoral system. And also further than that, it doesn't always have to be the electoral reform, it can be ideas um, that run aside from that, I would I would also personally love to see more women in parliament. Um, and I, I was recently um, checking, I think the average age of, of MEPs in parliament is something like 55. So I would definitely um, like to see more young people in parliament and also uh, working together with the European Youth Forum. Um, I think there is also a, a lack of, um, young people in the voice of, uh, of European citizens. And I don't think that's because young people don't have anything to say. I think it's because um, then there's something that needs to be changed and people, I mean, we have to give them some kind of motivation. Why, why would I otherwise vote? I mean, people want their voice to be heard. And um, if, there's a, if there's a common feeling that a vote doesn't really count that much or if the voice hasn't been heard, um, there must be something wrong with the system in that sense. So I think, Everything that was said so far are very great ideas and, and we support those. And yeah, I look forward to discussing any further ideas. I hope that wasn't too short or too long. I don't know if we're running out of time. <laughs> no, that was just perfect. Thank you very much. And again, some really interesting proposals and ideas we can look at. Uh, and when we look at the actual makeup uh, of the MEPs, uh, do, do we need to consider, for example, the gender makeup? Do we need to consider uh, also how many young people have seats in the kind of age as well? Uh, and are there any methods that, for example, FYG through our uh, organizations could introduce to, to promote that happening? Could quotas, for example, uh, be useful in that situation. I think that's something we can discuss uh, and debate. Uh, and I believe you mentioned the European Youth Forum uh, within that as well, which provides a really lovely tie to uh, our final guest for today. Uh, many FYG people, I think, will know Sebastian, uh, who hey, is yeah. So yes, feel free to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Sebastian, Sebastian Rood. And uh, nominated by FYG, I've been elected in the past uh, board of the European Youth Forum. And in the board of the European Youth Forum, I'm responsible for climate, for anti-discrimination, and for finances. Uh, with the European Youth Forum, we are the platform of youth organizations in Europe. And we unite over hundreds, hundreds uh, more than 100 uh, member organizations, among which FYG, but also Young European Socialists, Young European Federalists, and we are also a member of the European Movement International. So we try to make sure that we are the bridge uh, and that we are <clears throat> making one strong united voice for young people uh, in Europe. When it comes to the European Parliament, uh, one thing that bears us uh, a lot of worries is especially the low voter turnout among young people. Whereas at the same time, young people are not, uh, young people uh, want to be part of the decision. We have a lot to offer. We bring dynamism, we bring passion, we bring experience, we bring ideas. But at the same time, uh, the way that politics is addressed is not always addressing young people. So following the last election, we made a study that was called Youth Up. And we made a series of recommendations to make sure that traditional politics are able to respond to the changing phase of young people's participation. 
And I think the top three of those recommendations are that we need to promote political literacy and critical thinking through partnerships between, on the one hand, schools, formal education, but also informal education and youth organizations in joint program where they are part of curricula and that foster a more democratic culture so that young people can actually uh, are empowered to speak up, to be heard. Secondly, we believe that there should be more decision and poly uh, policy making that truly involves young people and gives them equal decision making power to make sure that we have more uh, young people at the table and not only at the table, but also enabling young people to really make a valuable uh, impact when they are invited. No tokenism, but real participation. And lastly, and I think that's something uh, that I would like to stress, is that we really believe that the voting age should be lowered to 16 in all elections, including the European Parliament elections. So this is one thing that we would like to stress. Also with our new campaign, Youth Up, well, it's not really new anymore, but we really would like to see that voting age uh, lowered. All the European Parliament uh, decided that they want to have the uh, voting age lowered to 16, but the problem is that uh, like member states decide for themselves how they organize it. So this poses quite a big trouble. And maybe one last thing to add is that we also, uh, jointly with the, I think it's the UN Youth Info, let me check. That we strongly invoke, uh, that we strongly encourage the Not Too Young to Run campaign, that more young people stand as candidates, because we believe that if you're old enough to vote, you're also old enough to run for office. And you indeed see that uh, the, the average age of members of the European Parliament is, uh, is quite old compared to um, situations where you, for example, would have more of a, uh, more of a, uh, how do you say that, uh, where you have different systems of elections, not, uh, not according to districts, in this ca uh, case countries, but uh, equal representation. Uh, and thus, I think at this moment, there might be only a few of the 750 members of the European Parliament that are actually under 30 years old, uh, 30, uh, 30 years of age. That's also something that we stress not only to lower the voting age, but to also encourage any young people to run, because we need as many young people as possible also to be elected as representative, to make sure that more young people uh, feel encouraged uh, to get engaged with politics. Not only in the way that what people address, because we think that there is a lot of gain that we can make, that if politicians actually also address the the risk of discrimination with young people, the risk of uh, risk of youth unemployment, the risk of uh, equal housing, social rights, climate rights. Basically, following that, uh, I think it will be really important to make sure that we don't only address the concerns of young people to make sure that they are involved, but we actually provide them equal access to the table, and then we also make sure that more young people run for the European Parliament. Um, if there are any questions, I'm more than willing to answer. And I think for now, this is more or less uh, what I would like to bring to the table. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. And some really interesting themes again there. Uh, I think we need to pick up on and it's great to see that there are programs encouraging actively uh, for young people to actually put themselves forward to be candidates and, and have that representation uh, and also the Youth Up campaign which I'm sure many people viewing will, will be uh, familiar with. So uh, we're now going to get into the meat of our discussion. We've actually only got about half an hour left uh, so I think that we'll probably combine the kind of topics together in terms of the questions uh, and we'll just kind of see what unfolds. Uh, I think there's a whole variety of themes that do connect in quite nicely. Uh, and also, if you would like to submit your questions, please tweet them at FYG and also submit them through Facebook. So I'm now going to hand over to Alexia, who is going to take us through the questions. Yeah, so my, my first question is about um, uh, an idea that I 
that I heard to um, make Europe more democratic. And I think you, you all already heard this, uh, this idea. Um, so I was wondering if, for example, a citizens, citizens chamber would be useful to increase uh, democracy in Europe. And, or do you think we can find other solution, solutions more um, that would be more useful to, to increase democracy? Or do you think uh, it would not be the solution? And uh, then I, I was also thinking about a kind of uh, randomized selection or um, um, a, a kind of European civil service and uh, i was i was just wondering about uh about these ideas and i would i would like to 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 have your opinion on that and uh and yeah so basically this is my question i don't know who wants to talk first I might, I might as well begin. So, uh, so you were uh, you were talking about um, citizens' conventions, right? Uh, the idea by Emmanuel Macron. Um, yeah, uh, the Young European Patriots uh, takes an interest in this idea. Um, it's of course a very a very interesting way to have citizens engaged directly together, rather than being mediated towards, uh, towards national governments. Um, after all, it's about, it's about creating a European constitution by the people and for the people. And it seems like it seems like an interesting idea. Um, I, I know that there are some caveats with it. Um, it, it might it might be that uh, after all, the questions do come from national governments. Um, if there is not enough European European wide content, then it becomes a series of na national consultations in twenty eight countries rather than one European consultation for one European demographic, uh, European demos. So there there are potential issues with the idea, but in principle, it seems rather interesting. And I know that many of our members are quite involved in, in these things, uh, in the other endeavors. Uh, when it comes to a European civil service, of course, the European Commission already uh, already has many of many such functions, and we are we are committed to developing the European Commission further. Can I just jump in here? Um, I, I think it's a um, it's a very interesting idea. I agree. I agree um, on what you sort of said. The um, the worry here is, I guess, um, first of all, that these um, these citizens consultations um, or forums that they are only national, that they turn into these sort of parallel um, discussions. And also, the problem is, if so many issues are discussed, um, how do we how do we manage to sort of get all these ideas and and criticisms and ideas um, from citizens into sort of one channel? And how can we make them comparable? Because I'm sure there's going to be so many ideas. One other problem is, of course. Um, how do we make sure that it's not always the same people that will attend or, or follow these kinds of consultations? I mean, that's a problem we deal with, especially in Brussels, which is a complete bubble. But um, that's one of our worries um, to make these consultations, you know, spreading out as far as possible and not focusing on certain uh, people, certain areas, certain backgrounds. Um, I mean, I think there's already some of these these kind of consultations have started in France already, and um, as far as I can see, it's really a, a danger of having, for example, too many um, high-level people speak, like ministers. I mean, the idea is definitely not to have another um, panel discussion. Um, so I, I'm I'm interested to see what comes out of it, and um, how all these ideas. Um, can actually be channeled and also um, if it's going to continue like if it's just a one-off thing which would be a pity um, just you know before elections I think it has to continue um, into next year and further to sort of carry on these ideas and not just let them fade into something can I um. So I totally agree with what was said. Um, I just would like to add that, just as it was said now, I mean, if it's if these tools are meant to be just another uh, way of having high-level meetings, it doesn't make any sense for me because the point is 
uh, what Sebastian said before, that, so that we need definitely to increase and improve political literacy, especially, not only, but especially regarding the European Union. So while instruments like the European Union Civil Service or uh, like one of our proposals to make the Erasmus Plus program accessible, for instance, for all the apprentices and the workers as well, do make the EU closer to the citizens. First of all, because they let them understand better how it works. Second of all, because it makes the EU more accessible for everybody. Other instruments or tools like creating a, a citizens chamber or our ways like this don't really do that in the sense that they don't um they don't they bring they don't bring the debate about the eu down to the daily life of every citizen of the eu they don't increase the european citizenship as a concept and as something tangible and concrete for everybody but they only make it actually look farther and more distant from the real life of everybody in the european union especially the weakest ones I think I would uh, agree with that as well, to a point. I think one of the challenges that we're facing is the fact that a lot of these ideas are coming from a kind of top-down hierarchy. Uh, and there hasn't really been a sense of engaging citizens on what frameworks they would like to use to interact with uh, the European institutions and debate with them. But equally, although I say that, it's very hard to get the perfect solution uh, and the perfect answer to that. But I, I think it would be intriguing to, to create spaces to identify ways in which people can feedback uh, to the European Union about issues. Uh, and it has to be done, obviously, in a way that won't just continuously pick the same people. And I think that's part of the problem, as, as Vanessa did pick up on before, that we do tend to have the same people around the table. Uh, and how can we kind of go beyond that and engage? Uh, and I've always been curious to explore the role of technology uh, and how technology can be part of that, uh, whether it could be simple innovations on uh, online voting, although there are security issues that need to be ironed out, uh, but also if there was a way to bring European politics into people's pockets, into, into their phones and in a way that is digestible, whether that could change the dynamic and whether people could, in an easier and more accessible way, actually engage in those conversations and, and, and contributions. Sebastian. Uh, can I? Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to respond to both Elisa and Yusem. In one, one of the things with the European Youth Forum that we try to do is empower more young people. Uh, we want to make sure that youth organizations are actually reaching more young people, not only their privileged, but like, and we believe that youth organizations are doing so, but we want to do even more. We want to do even better. We want to go even beyond greatness. And one thing that we are now fighting for, and that we hope that you all support us for, is that we want to actually have the Erasmus Plus budget multiplied by 10. This is not just some random ambitious, oh, look at young people being, uh, being uh, uh, dreamers. Actually, a lot of member states are actually supporting our claim to increase the Erasmus, uh, the Erasmus Plus fund by 10 times. So this is something that we are fighting for, that funds for youth organizations are going to be multiplied by 10. So youth organizations can empower more young people. So also more young people and different young people are able to find their way to the table. So if you would be willing, please support us with this important campaign to make sure that with Erasmus Times, then more youth organizations can empower more young people to have an amazing life-changing experience. Uh, and more youth organizations are able to do the greatness that they're doing every day, but then in a better way, better finance, better equipped. Thank you. Alexia. Yeah, I was I was more thinking about something um, that would not just allow people to propose things, 
but um really to to be involved in the in the um, in the making process of the of the law the european law of the of the um, um yeah the european law and i i wanted to know your your opinion about that about it really involving people in um in the making in, in the making process of the law this sounds a lot like the European Citizens Initiative. Um, of course, that it, that starts from a, a, a citizen proposing something, but there are several ways in which you could develop that into a proper dialogue and conversation with the European institutions. So the Young European Federalist has uh, has in the past uh, taken positions on the European Citizens Initiative and developing it further. Um, for example, by having public hearings in the plenary of the European Parliament with stakeholders and ex other experts. Um, that, that's one way to engage in a proper conversation between the developers of the ECI and the decision makers. And I Personally, I think like there, there are several things about the Citizens Initiative that make it hard and discourage people to use that actually pretty good instrument. Um, for, for example, the fact that it's only 12 months to collect a million signatures is something that might be found discouraging by people. Um, so extending the period into say 18 months or even even more might be a good device to to ensure that and that the names are collected a prosperous support with uh, support centers uh, for developers of initiatives as well could be could be a good idea so, so uh, yeah person uh, coming from Finland uh, I believe that this is this initiative is something that can work and in Finland it does work so and in the UK, of course, uh, the UK Parliament receives petitions on, on a regular basis. So that is something that we just need to make work at the European level. Um, I'll, I'll jump in quickly, really quickly. Um, definitely, I think also Finland has quite a lot of good ideas out there. Um, also referring to what Sam said in, in sort of techno, um, sort of digital revolution or digital ideas in that sense. Um, also, I think there's further ideas, not necessarily um, digital, where um, ideas um, can be crowdsourced uh, via some sort of, whether it's a committee or a sort of group that um, that can bring in ideas and, and proposals for, for legislation. Um, I mean, that would be uh, probably very far off, but how about having a, you know, a committee in the parliament that only consists of, of citizens? Um, I mean, there's some you know there's so many ways of, of including citizens in a, in a more permanent way and not only using elections um as a sort of um campaign to to involve citizens and then for the next few years it's silence again until the next elections no definitely i think i think that's a really good point and uh going back to the point about the petitions and the citizens initiative as well uh i think that one of the most positive experiences i've seen of petitions used in democratic processes uh, has been through the welsh assembly uh, in the uk in which the barrier originally was very low actually and they ended up i think it was only 10 signatures to begin with but it went up to i think it was about 2000 uh, and the first thing to come through was uh, a motion called uh, by local musicians and local fans of musicians uh, to protect music venues in Wales. Uh, and they wanted to introduce something that was called agent of change principle, which means when somebody decides to build a block of flats next to a venue, they have to pay for the venue to have soundproofing. Uh, and with this one petition, it became the first to reach the new threshold. It had to have a parliamentary debate. Uh, and it was very clear that this was something that was a serious change that was needed, but also something that uh, was purely led from a grassroots level by citizens as opposed to being taken on by party politics uh, and had a really positive effect uh, as well. So I think that those kind of things can work, but whether a million is a figure uh, for a European citizens initiative, does that mean that these campaigns can only be led, for example, by NGOs, as opposed to truly being citizen led? And is that a good thing or, or a bad thing? I think we can have that discussion uh, on debate. Uh, I'll pass back to Alexia now, I think, for the next question.
Yeah, so my, my question would be related to something you've said um, about the responsibility of political parties to promote European elections, and uh, I will add to promote uh, European politics and politics in general. Um, and I was wondering if, um, if we could do something to, um, to uh, improve the involvement of uh, people and young people in European politics because I feel this is my opinion maybe you will disagree that because in my country I feel that young people aren't very engaged in politics in general and so in European politics even less so uh, I was I was wondering first why do you think young people are not interested in politics and European politics and uh, what can motivate them? So, Eliza, you mentioned, and uh, also Yuza, you mentioned uh, Erasmus, and uh, uh, you mentioned other, um, and Sebastian too, you mentioned, um, so Erasmus, European Civil Service, etc. And uh, I was also thinking about a free interrail, um, the extension of the free interrail program, and uh, I, I was wondering what, what is your opinion about that? And uh, so, yeah, again, this is my, a very long question, but uh, you're free to, you are free to answer. I wonder if we could go to uh, Elisa first. Thank you. Yeah, um, I like your proposal about the free interrail. Nevertheless, I think that both this proposal, but also the, the proposal to make Erasmus Plus more accessible to more people, relates more to the European citizenship as a thing then to the participation of young people and of people in general to, uh, to politics. Um, meaning that one can have a great Erasmus um, experience and afterwards being an, an enthusiastic uh, person about the European Union doesn't mean it will be uh, very much involved into politics and political life of uh, his, her country or the European Union. Um, I come from Italy, a country where only we don't have so, um, definitive figures about the youth turnout, but we assume only 60% of people aged under uh, 25 voted at the elections, and it was national elections, not even the European ones, where even lower figures, um, we have even low fi lower figures for that. Uh, I think the fact that the youth is not involved politically is one of the major failures of the political parties, no matter where in the political spectrum. I include the left wing in those who are failing at this. Uh, I think it's because the youth is not represented in politics and the youth, although there's uh, a lot of speeches and discussions about, for instance, lately, uh, unfortunately, youth unemployment. In the end, it's only old people talking about youth unemployment and the youth doesn't really have the possibility to affect the debate and to be protagonist of it. I know it sounds a lot like rhetoric. I'm not proposing anything very concrete, but I think that um, to bring this debate closer to the young people, when I say so, I mean, bring it to the schools, for instance, bring it to the schools more than to the universities, because you find more people there. If you start talking about uh, civil education from the very beginning, the primary school, then you have, first of all, the possibility to enhance the political literacy of people, and therefore the possibility to understand and have a conscious debate about politics in general, and the European Union especially, that is unfortunately the subject where the debate is biased the most, and we hear most of the fake news and so on. And just one last thing, uh, youth wing of parties and the possibility for youth organizations to be autonomous is definitely, definitely uh, important there. I, I think that for me, that's always been the kind of the nail on the head with the problem of youth engagement in politics, that there are not people that look or sound like us actually in those chambers, or if there are, it's a very rare thing uh, that we only have a handful of politicians who are expected to hold this burden of representing all of the young people across Europe, especially with those issues and challenges. And I think that there is a problem where there are a lot of exercises of, of paying lip service to young people 
uh, by politicians that when it actually comes for them to support us to run, uh, and I think this is a problem across the entire political spectrum, uh, that instantly when the idea of a young person running for parliament is, is discussed, uh, patronising terms usually follow and an expectation that we are the future and not the now. And I think that that's uh, something that we constantly need to challenge uh, as organisations connected to young people. How do we get rid of that bizarre rhetoric that we, despite the fact that we, many of us uh, can, can be of the age of candidacy, why we have to wait to inherit all of these future problems rather than be able to, to access uh, and deal with them. Uh, I'm going to go to Sebastian next. Thank you. Well, one of, one of the things I think young people are, are involved, young people are engaged, but maybe not in the way, uh, maybe not at this moment with sufficient political progress, uh, uh, with uh, sufficient political processes. Because as young people, we cont continuously try to see how we can make an impact. For example, a lot of Dutch people, uh, Dutch young people, uh, in my home country, decided to boycott Starbucks because of tax evasion. And I think young people are really aware how to make an impact on so social media in many other ways, but normally outside of political processes, because we feel those political processes do not uh, address our issues, do not address our concerns, and not being, uh, and the young people there are not either uh, through participatory processes fully engaged or by having young, uh, by young representatives uh, elected in office. So I think in those regards, we young people are engaged. But if like young people are, are not stupid, we sense where we can make an impact, we sense where we can make a difference. And if that's not in politics, that's not where we're going to make our impacts. So I think in that sense, we need to make sure that there's some real uh, participation and some real representation of young people in political systems and that's the only way of getting more young people uh, and that's the only real way to get more young people engaged because if their opinion doesn't matter we're not going to engage engage in tokenism i think uh, young people are smart enough to see when they're just invited for the picture and not for the real participation so if we are making an impact then we will join but otherwise we will contribute in a different manner where we can make an impact. And I think that's something that's strongly powerful about our generation, but it's also something that is struggling and is indeed a challenge of general political process to make sure that young people are invited at the table and are able to make an impact. And then young people will come. Don't worry. Thank you. Yes, I think you've, you've picked on something really interesting there that I, that I also think is um, part of, discussion and debates. Uh, I often find that many of the young people I've engaged with as a activist from a political party are more interested in the issues and campaigning than the traditional notion of a political party and how it's uh, kind of conceived and their involvement within it. Uh, and that poses a challenge in the upcoming European election. Uh, I think on looking at these traditional notions of political parties and trying to see how we can break them apart uh, and connect them back together. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, you, sir, next. Um, so one interesting thing is about European, ele uh, uh, European elections and transnational lists. Um, um, I gave it a bit of thought in an article on the New Federalist, the Jeff, Jeff newspaper. Uh, I, can, I can put it on the YouTube live feed so you can read it as well. It was, it was about how transnational lists might actually favour young up-and-coming candidates in European elections, because uh, there are not enough many established figures at the European level. Uh, we we know we know people like Scott Keller from the Greens and so on, but um, there are not seventy three or even forty six of these people necessarily. So what you're going to need is new people at the European level who would not necessarily get a seat at the national level, but who might just do at the European level with a nice digital social media focused campaign because that, frankly, is the easiest way to reach 500 million people. You can only be in one place at the same time, but on social media, it can be in 10. So it, 
it is quite possible that actually transnationalists, especially a sufficiently large transnational constituency, would be something that offers opportunities, at least for a certain number of young people to come to the European Parliament. And not only that, but these young people would then have a proper European wide mandate. In one sense, they have a stronger mandate from the European people than any national level candidate does. And that might even increase their stature in the European Parliament right from the beginning. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexia. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question to Elisa about what you said. Um, because you talk about bringing the debate to the school. And I was uh, thinking about uh, what about something more um, of an informal education, because we're always talking about school, but maybe, maybe we will reach more people if we bring the debate outside the school with a more informal education and i was wondering what could be the um, what what could be the um, the form of this kind of informal edu education yeah uh, i mentioned the school because um it's the place everywhere at least everywhere in europe where um people from all kinds of backgrounds gather, come together and learn the same things. So that's why I was referring to public education and, and schools. But of course, um, informal education is just as important as formal education. And for instance, in YES, we, when we do the workshops, when we have them, we always have them with informal and non-formal education methods, for instance, because they're clearly uh, more effective at vehiculating any kind of message than than formal education tools. Um, the first thing I can think about now answering your question is, um, for instance, trying to make sure that as many youth organizations as po and associations as possible, and we're not thinking only of the political ones now, but also just to name a couple, um, youth wings of NGOs such as the Red Cross or um, the Scouts, or all the other youth organizations that are members, for instance, of the European Youth Forum, trying to make sure that they have a number of workshops or activities dedicated to the European Union as well in their activity plans, not to force an organization to, to have some binding program, of course, or activity plan. But this is the very first thing I can think about now when you ask me what kind of informal education ways we could have uh, to bring this debate to to the places where the young people go normally and not because they they are interested in the european debate at first but maybe where they can become interested in it thank you for that elisa uh, sebastian will sadly have to leave us but i just wonder if you could just offer us some quick final thoughts before you have to go Yes, um, well, thank you very much for this uh, for this webinar. It has been very interesting. Thank you all who joined. Uh, thank the other panelists for uh, for your contribution and for the really interesting questions. Uh, I think, in general, uh, concluding, I want to echo uh, I want to echo our three most important recommendations. Make sure that we uh, that we actually engage youth organisations and schools in making sure that we promote critical thinking but by truly empowering youth organizations, among others, with more uh, funds for Erasmus Plus. Secondly, that we also need to lower the voting age to 16, and not only lowering it in all EU countries, but also making sure that more young candidates are running. Uh, and lastly, I think we need to make sure that young people are having more meaningful places where they can actually sit at the table and make an impact. And I think with young people enabled and empowered to make an impact, great things are going to happen. Well, we need to go there. And for you, the question, how do we make sure that young people are able to make an impact? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great evening. And I hope to see uh, many of you soon in person. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And yes, uh, Sebastian has, has left uh, his email if you want to get in touch. Uh, we can post that uh, on the chat as well. So thank you uh, and goodbye for now. So we're going to go to some of the questions that we've had sent in. Uh, this first question, I believe, is from Stefano Rossi. 
uh, and it's kind of a comment and a question. Uh, people feel involved in the EU if they are in a position to know the political agenda and the candidates they are voting for go for coalitions and spits and candidaten. So I guess the question to kind of formulate around that is what your thoughts are on the spits and candidaten model uh, and also about this idea of coalitions and for example do we need to look at progressive caucuses uh, and yes do they pose challenges or, or are they something uh, that we can engage with uh, i'm also conscious of uh, various participants times uh, so i'm going to ask vanessa if you would be willing to kind of comment on things first because i know you might have to go in a bit sure um thanks for putting me forward um maybe on the first part of, of that question um on on sort of the the I guess European sphere and and how trans or how Spitzenkandidaten can help improve that. Um, I think um, they're definitely a good idea. I think there there's room for improvement. There's there's room for um, for expanding that idea. Another idea to add here, um, which is kind of linked to it, is also um, European media. I think media plays a big role um, aside from us, aside from all these organisations that are involved and that can and that can um, inform, uh, that can can help citizens um, build their own voice and opinion. I think media is is um, crucial, and I think um, with Spitzenkandidaten and the, the right um, coverage, uh, it can engage more people and it can give. Um, the European elections a different sort of dimension in that sense. Um, but I think it's a very new idea, so um, it's definitely not not perfect yet. Thank you very much. Yes, and one of the things that I think would be a really interesting proposition uh, is also if uh, there was a kind of model similar to Spitz and Candidat and to promote youth candidates uh, and whether we could perhaps see uh, a kind of at least a debate between candidates that are kind of representative uh, of the youth side of the various uh, political parties running as well and whether they could have a model where we have kind of the youth candidate representing at least at that debate if not throughout the campaign as well. Uh, I'm going to go to Elisa next on this point. Uh, yeah we Yes, is uh, is in favor of the Spitzakaya process. It's true, it can be improved, uh, no doubt. Um, I agree with what Vanessa said about the media coverage as uh, a very crucial part of the process to make it wider and really more democratic. In terms of uh, coalitions, I believe it would be important, well, from a left-wing perspective, I think it would be uh, absolutely fundamental to make, to increase the chances for the left-wing to win to win the, the next European elections, but also in terms of uh, democracy and improve the understanding of European Union functioning for the citizens, it would be important for them to have a clear picture of what parties could be allied with, what are the parties in, um, in case they get enough votes to, to have the majority in the commission and the parliament. So um, yes, I'm in favor of it, as I said at the beginning. And for, the young people to be more protagonists of it. Um, I think the primaries should be the way to choose the spits and candidates to to increase the chances for a young person to be the candidate there. Thank you very much. Uh, Yusuf? Um, yeah, I would just like to reiterate that the Young European Fetish is strongly in favour of the spits and candidate system, but yes, certainly believes that it should be developed. So um, I, looked, I looked into some statistics, um, there, there were surveys about like how many voters actually knew of the Spitzenkandidaten in 2014. Um, it was down to 1.1% of voters in one, in one of the countries and it, it doesn't come as a surprise to many that the country was the United Kingdom. Um, it, it is a problem that, the, that these candidates are not promoted. Um, European white public media is very weak at the moment. Um, national level political parties are so far not very willing to do that. And in our in our campaign, we are push we are pushing national level parties to do that. 
uh, to engage with their European level parties because that is frankly right for democracy. They will be doing that in the parliament. So might as well be honest and say that before the election as well. So that is something that our national sections are doing, um, engaging with, with parties um, to ensure that European dimension for the European elections. Um, the, the youth debate that was mentioned is quite an interesting idea. Um, haven't thought of haven't thought of myself. Um, at the national level, you ha you often have young, young candidates' debates. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't have that at the European level. Thank you very much. And yes, I think that there is there was a problem at the last European election about identifying who those candidates were. Uh, and many Greens watching will remember that we actually did have a primary to choose who our Spitzen candidates were. Uh, we had two, uh, Scar Keller and uh, Jose Bove, uh, and we did end up having a process in which uh, FYG was engaged and rallied, you know, behind certain candidates who held certain opinions. But even with that kind of engagement, it was still a struggle to be able to present that on a wider stage. And of course, in the UK, uh, there was no discussion at all about who these people were and what it meant, and uh, there wasn't even a debate. Whereas I believe some countries had a debate between the Spitzenkandidatens uh, actually broadcast on television, or there might have been a European-wide one. I don't know if someone can remember and correct me. Uh, but even those kind of processes I know do enliven politics, uh, having those kind of television debates and allowing people to see the kinds of people that they're voting for uh, can be a very uh, big event. Oh, yes, uh, Yus has just told me Euro News broadcast it. And yes, the UK does watch your news. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, Alexia, do you have some thoughts you want to share on this? Yeah, that, that would be uh, kind of repetitive. So I don't have any thoughts on it. I will let let the I will let it as you said. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Nick. Well, we've got another question that has come through uh, from Christy, uh, who's saying that voter participation in European elections is declining uh, since its opening to the public. In fact, the last European election had the lowest ever turnout. Whatever the reasons are, do you believe that compulsory voting? might be an option to get people closer to the federal level of Europe. So that the idea of compulsory voting is, I believe you get fined if you don't turn out and vote. And I think Australia is one of the only countries in the world where, <laughs> where this happens. Uh, just because of time, uh, I'm going to go to Vanessa first. Uh, and I'm aware that you'll have to leave us in a bit. So if you want to offer any final thoughts and kind of wrap up, feel free. Yeah, I think this will be my final thought, and then I'll say I'll say goodbye after a really interesting discussion. Um, I, I personally don't think that compulsory voting um, is is the solution. Although I think, um, I mean, looking at some countries, you do see an increase, of course. I mean, but I don't think it's the the proper solution behind um, getting um, a higher a higher turnout. Um, I think it's not um, addressing the proper um, reasons behind why people don't go to vote i think we've discussed already quite a few of these these reasons and um primarily i see that people are maybe more out of touch not um feeling represented by the people that are actually meant to represent them so if people don't go to vote um make forcing them to go to vote is not going to solve the problem so um on this i'm gonna i'm gonna say goodbye and uh thanks for inviting me to this webinar it was very interesting to talk to you, and I, I really do hope that um, we get to meet in person. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And you can find out about European Movement International uh, by going to their website, and you can Google that. We can post a link to that. Uh, and you can always get in touch with them and find out and participate in the amazing workshops they do. I'm sure there'll be another kind of 48 hours for democracy or a similar event coming soon. So keep your eyes peeled. And thank you very much to Vanessa for giving your time to talk to us this evening. Hello. Uh, okay, we're gonna go next uh, to Yusa on this topic. 
Um, thanks. Um, Vanessa really said it all on mandatory voting. Um, I completely agree that it doesn't address the fundamental reasons why people are not voting. Um, we have been talking about how the European Parliament has been too weak for uh, to gather people's interest. Um, the Parliament has grown stronger over the decades, of course, but it's still not quite there yet. Um, of course, media coverage of the European Parliament is another thing. Um, people people don't really see the European Parliament on the on their TV screens. Um, they don't see the Parliament making decisions. They don't they don't see the, uh, they don't see the seats in the European Parliament mattering that much uh, in their in their lives, and that that's because the European Parliament is strong not strong enough, uh, perhaps not politicized enough. Um, it 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 doesn't give you intent incentive to go to the polls. That's what that's one thing to fix that definitely. And um, well, I'm, I'm just banging on about transnationalists and Spitzenkandidaten, but I believe that both both might might be quite appropriate solutions to this. Transnationalists would add new spice to the European elections. That's something that humankind has probably never done before. Uh, that, that's a unique. <laughs> that's a unique selling point for the European elections. And of course, Spitzenkandidaten is something that lets you decide whether uh, whether it's going to be Juncker or Schulz or someone else who becomes the European Commission leader. That is a clear choice for the people. Um, that's that's a choice that they already had in 2014. We just need to make it clear to the people. Um, that will bring them to a pause. Thank you. Uh, and I wonder, Elisa, if you have any thoughts. And also, I think that it's quite interesting if we do keep following the Spitz and Kandidaten model, uh, do we run a risk of turning it into personality politics would be the kind of question attached to that. Could that be a potential downside if it becomes a presidential uh, debate and discussion? So we'll go to you first, Elisa, and then Alexia, if you want to add your comments in afterwards. Thank you. Um, I agree what was said before, so I won't repeat it. Just would like to stress what Sebastian said, also re replying to another question, so that it's not the interest in politics, that it's so low, but the interest in voting for people that are not really representing you or, or not perceived as potential real representatives. And that's also why I think it's absolutely important for our generation to make a great effort to renew our parties and make them more closer and they make them more relevant basically for our citizens because it's true the turnout is getting lower and lower for the European elections but the same goes for national elections. Um, making elections compulsory wouldn't solve it. Uh, what would solve it would be to renew the political parties in a way that are more inclusive and more um, and look and are more representative of the, the people needs and demands. Um, I agree that there's a risk of um, making European politics more about personalities than proposals and platforms by giving too much importance to the Spitzer candidate process. I also believe, though, that this process can boost the um, the European level of, of political parties um, life, meaning that uh, nowadays the PS, for instance, it's quite federated, but it's definitely not as federated as uh, the young European socialists are. And it is true that it's still a discussion. Uh, it's much more like uh, an intergovernmental discussion in the past than a federalist one. Uh, I think maybe the Spitzen candidate can boost the process for the national parties to come together um, in a more really European way and not just representing national um, voices there. Yeah. So can I? Yep. Okay. So yeah, I I, I agree with uh, all of you, and I, I think I think. Yeah, it's about uh, bringing Europe more more close to people. But I I was also wondering about um, the European Parliament visibility. And um, I was wondering about um, the, the, the usefulness of uh, kind of advertisement to, to uh, bring the work of the European Parliament more close to people. I think your solution is federalism. But um, do you have? I mean, do do you have other solution to 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 advertise the work of the European Parliament, or or would it be your your 
on this solution. Um, is it my turn? Um, well, first I wanted to ad address the personality politics that was discussed. Um, actually, I don't really think that should be a problem at the European level. Um, what you usually hear is that you've got these faceless full of Brussels bureaucrats. We've all heard that. So if it's a spectrum between that and between personality politics, where you got Donald Trump versus Oprah Winfrey running for president, then I, I don't think we're on, on the latter end yet. Um, I think there's room for a bit more personality in European politics and it would spark, in, spark interest in it. I don't know. Um, but I, I can't even think of like a proper European celebrity that, that will be running for European Commission. But once you got that, that kind of a person as a candidate, I'll change my mind. Um, I, I don't know about other solutions than federalism to, to sparking interest in the European Union. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm all, all about institutions as a person. And I'm just like, well, make it more democratic and people will care. That's what federalism is all about in the end, about more democracy at the, at the level where important decisions are made. I'll get back to that if I get any other thoughts. Thank you. Uh, I think in response to Alexi's question about whether we could do something beyond federalism, I think one of the largest fundamental issues for all citizens uh, is this idea of what is European identity, what are the boundaries of European identity, what does it mean? And I always, I, I've said this about a hundred times at various events this year, there's only two cultural things that I can think of that are branded and are seen as European. Uh, the first is the Eurovision Song Contest. And I love the smiles that I get when I say that. <laughs> I love it, it's amazing. Uh, and the second one, of course, is the European golf team for the Ryder Cup. And there are not really any of the spaces that we have to actually discuss or exchange our cultures in a way that is saying that we are European. Equally as well, I think that identity as a construct doesn't necessarily mean that we are saying, you know, to be European is to be white, to be European is to be Christian, to be European is even to be born within the continent. Uh, and I've seen so many interesting views within so-called nationalist parties, even within, for example, the Scottish nationalists. Uh, I, I once saw uh, Nicola Sturgeon speak at the European Green Party Council, in which she said that her idea of being Scottish uh, can be changed and can be in flux to when people migrate to Scotland and can contribute to that identity and see how it grows. And I think that nationalism in itself is uh, a problem. Uh, but I think that within the boundaries of calling ourselves European, I think that we can have a Europe that is something where we can look at combining uh, all of our cultural practices and saying that this is a European thing, but it can also change and develop with the various people who choose to make Europe their, you know, their home, a place to live. Uh, and we can look at ways to support that. And I think that one way to do that would be to be able to fund initiatives where we can have cultural exchange, where we can come together and actually put our kind of cultural practices and values on the table uh, and kind of maybe take the bits that we enjoy and kind of combine them together uh, and find new ways to actually say, right, this is what it means to be European. Here are some cultural practices we can do. Uh, and let's embrace the Eurovision Song Contest more. You know, let's look at those kind of spaces where we can have those ideas, even though it's something that seems really fun and and a bit unusual. The idea originally of the contest was to create something in which all Europeans would be watching on television. And how can we create more kind of cultural interventions like that? So more Eurovision, please. And I don't even care if like the whole world ends up in Eurovision and uh, everybody vote for France this year because it's a really good song. Uh, Alexia. Yeah, we have a question from Stefano Rossi, I think. Yes. Um, so he's asking how to 
empower the European dimension of the Europe, European elections? And why not insert a common logo or the name of the Spitzenkandidat in the symbol of all the national parties for the European elections? Yeah, um, that is, that is a policy for the young European federalists. That there should be there should be the European level parties logo or on the ballot. That is that is certainly a part of the solution. It is um, it is certainly not the not the entire solution. Um, it's it's more about people recognizing the uh, the names and the logos and the faces on during the campaign. Um, then on the on the ballot, it it just says it, but you're not going to read the ballot uh, as you're voting. It's it's just just the symbolic um, symbolic end of it. Um, I already put it on the YouTube chat, but yeah, I wanted to sh <laughs> share a reflection on Sam's thing because um, I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, yeah, the Scottish National Party's official position is that I am Scottish. Um, I was born in Finland in, in 1996, and I moved to Scotland in 2016. Uh, I've lived here for less than two years now, but whoever has chosen to make Scotland home is Scottish. Um, um, I find I find it nice to tell that to English nationalists who are who are asking me to go go home. I'm like, well, you probably think that Scotland should be a part of the UK, right? So, well, the Scottish government says that I'm Scottish, and you say that Scottish people are British, so I'm British. So, so why why are you telling me? So, yeah, identity indeed is a very complex and flexible phenomenon in the end. Thank you, Elisa. I support the idea of having the, the European party's logos on the ballot. <clears throat> Again, um, as you said, it's important that people actually understand what the logo is and are able to relate it to something that they know. Uh, so again, if it's just a matter of putting logo on ballot, and I know it's not what we're discussing now, but sometimes in a general debate, we have this impression that it's more about putting a logo on the ballot than actually making that logo um, meaningful for the people watching it. I just wanted to add something to what Sam said about culture and places where to discuss our common culture that I like very much, as I would go all the way down for more Eurovision for sure. I uh, just want to say that um, Europeans are 7% of the, the world population and we own 49% uh, of the world welfare state systems. I think, uh, of course, because I am a socialist, but not only, that we should uh, reflect on it a bit more and, and really think about how much the welfare and social policies are part of our culture and how much um, pointless it is to have a European Union where we have no social, where we have a first social pillar now, but social policies are not really at the center of the European Union project. And it's what really makes Europe different in terms of how it functions in comparison to the rest of the world. So I think when thinking about European identity, this is something we should discuss more about. And definitely, I think one of the biggest discussions uh, that needs to be had in Europe is definitely about a minimum wage to be introduced across Europe uh, and the impact that would have, uh, particularly on the immigration debate, because of uh, for many people who had followed the Brexit debate in the United Kingdom, well, for a lot of people that was about immigration uh, and deceptive comments about people coming from elsewhere in Europe and undercutting wages, whereas obviously a European minimum wage wouldn't allow companies to make that exploitation. Let's be clear, it's the companies, if that has taken place at all, who have made that decision and not the people who have chosen to move for work. Uh, and I think that there are other opportunities as well. Uh, from the green perspective, one thing that we want to, you know, kind of explore is this idea of having a shared energy union. And, you know, why not put wind turbines in windy countries? Let's, you know, put loads of solar panels in the med. Let's capture that energy and actually share it between people. Uh, I was recently in Belgrade uh, and I went to Nikolai Tesla Museum and heard how he'd actually attempted to try and create uh, an energy system for the entire world and didn't manage to be successful and had plans destroyed by an energy company and oil giant. Uh, but I think that having those kind of 
cross European things, whether it's in energy infrastructure, whether it's welfare, can also solidify what that identity is and could also revolutionize and change things. So I think that alongside reforming the institution and having more access to it, there needs to be policies that are actually truly pan-European and, and reflecting that. And I think that freedom of movement has been a wonderful, glorious thing. And I think that that has been an important step. But I, I agree with Elisa that that there there could be more. Uh, you saw, do you want to do you want to come on? Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that just reminded me of the Schumann Declaration, which said that Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements, which first creates a de facto solidarity. Um, that is exactly what you just said. So yeah, indeed. Um, maybe, maybe I'm going off on tangents a bit now, but um, that's something that we are struggling with with young European movement UK, of course, uh, here in the UK. This. Britain's problem with Europe, you know, like for 40 years, it has been this other, a bit hostile, um, the, the other side of the table. But um, what what the UK really is, is a part of the European family. So that that is a deep cultural change that has to take place in the United Kingdom uh, beyond Brexit, uh, whether or not Brexit happens, that is still something that the, the United Kingdom has to over, overcome in order to be a prosperous, peaceful, stable society. And um, yeah, like I, I believe that youth organizations are actually in the best position to do that. Um, we, we can mobilize people, uh, we can unite them together with these progressive ideas, and then we'll go there and make a change and spread to our children as well. Oh, that's so inspirational, I love it. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, so we are coming sadly to the end of this wonderful discussion and webinar. And thank you so much for the people who've sent questions in via Facebook, Twitter, whatever else we had going on. Um, and as we've only got about three minutes left, uh, to leave us on a really positive note, uh, I'm gonna ask everybody uh, to kind of contribute one thing that they would like to see happen in the future that can make European Parliament more accessible to young people. So what kind of big change do you want to happen? Uh, and I'm going to start off, I can see people's faces thinking, so I don't want to like suddenly put somebody on the spot. <laughs> Does anyone want to go first? Who's got an idea? Can I? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I really wish to see something also a bit, I think, quite realistic in the end, if we want it. Uh, I wish to see a huge common campaign uh, by the youth wings of the Progressive Caucus uh, parties uh, that is centered on youth political participation to the European elections. I think it's just a first step, doesn't make the parliament more accessible for the youth, but it's a first step to start with. I feel that's a really tangible step that we, we should definitely do. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Elisa. Uh, who wants to go next? I'll just go with the Jeff chant, which is Federazione Europea Subito. <laughs> so, well, he, here's your federalism again, uh, European Federation immediately. It, 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 it is about. It is about democracy for all. Um, it is for young people in particular uh, because uh, that democracy spreads uh, in digital platforms. Uh, I talked about I talked about transnational lists, for example. It it, where it actually is going to take place is on the internet, and that's where I spend time at least. Thank you very much, Alexia. I was thinking about an educational program uh but i don't know which which concrete form would it would it um, take i will think about it <laughs> wonderful and my kind of final thought i want to offer is i think that we should see a youth debate between all of the youth wings happening 
during the election next year and let's you know maybe have a youth equivalent to the Spitzenkandidat and, and let's see more young people running you know I'd love to see some of the people in this chat run uh I can't because I live in the UK <laughs> but if there's anyone out there watching do consider running for parliament do consider putting yourself forward because we need you we need your voices in there uh and you can have the ability to make change uh we often talk a lot in FYG about one of our MEPs, Terry Ranker, who joined uh, before the age of 13, has made such immense differences and was in Time magazine uh, as part of People of the Year for being part of the Me Too uh, campaign as well. So you can actually make amazing change and differences. Uh, and thank you very much for watching the webinar this evening. Thank you to uh, Vanessa and Sebastian, who sadly had to leave us earlier. Thank you very much to Yusa. Thank you very much to Elisa. And thank you to my colleague Alexia for what has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, you can continue the debate on Twitter. Uh, I really hope no one gets trolled about this, but that's the way these debates go, isn't it? <laughs> Get rid of trolls, there's another, another engagement. Uh, but you can also uh, follow uh, our respective people on Twitter. You can see the tweets that we put out about that. And keep your eyes peeled because of, I've got a feeling that the people in this poll are going to be working together over the coming year on saving the future of Europe. Uh, and whether that includes the UK or not will remain to be seen. <laughs> but thank you very much for participating, everybody. Uh, and I hope you all have a good evening. Uh, and thank I think you very we much. can. I'm just going to quickly say big, big thank you to Javier as well, who hasn't been seen or spoken, but has been behind the scenes making tonight work. So thank you so much, Javier. Uh, and with that note, I think we can cut and go off air. Thank you again.